Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. This is actually our recent research on ransomware. It's a follow-up project on our previous study on ransomware that published last year at Dimba. So the first question is, uh, what is a ransomware attack? A ransomware attack is um, a class of malware that locks the digital resources of the user and requests money. So after a successful ransomware attack, the user has two options. One is to pay the ransom fee with uh, the hope of receiving the data back or permanently losing access to the data. So if the user agrees to pay the ransom fee, he will receive the private key that is generated remotely by, uh, in, in the CNC server and can be used for decrypting the files. This is a typical ransom node that is shown to user after successful ransomware attack. Uh, depending on the ransomware family or the geographical location of the user, a different ransom node can be shown to the user. So the, the attack is very straightforward and it's very simple. And it has been in the wild since uh, last decade. But the recent resurgence of this class of malware has resulted in increasing concern on how to detect or defend against this class of malware. For example, the recent uh, attack on hospitals across the US, at least three uh, hospitals were impacted by ransomware, were on the news. And universities in Canada were also, uh, was also impacted with ransomware and uh, last year, police department in Massachusetts had to pay the ransom in order to get the data back. So the, there is uh, no estimation about the financial cost of ransomware, but a recent report shows that uh, in just three months, more than uh, $2 million were the amount that they uh, made by uh, data extortion from the user. So the attack is, uh, has an uh, impact and it's uh, destructive and make uh, users suffer. So the question is how we can detect or defend against this class of malware. There are at least three approaches that can minimize the risk of ransomware. One is, and the most important one is educating the end user. For example, having a reliable backup policy for the user can help them. Or uh, teaching them for having a uh, safe browsing on a web. For example, not clicking every links they see or uh, opening every attachment that they have in their email. And two, developing tools that help defenders and reverse engineers to get insight about internal uh, behavior of a ransomware. For example, how the crypto system works, how the keys are generated, how the keys are maintained by the crypto system. And uh, three is protection approaches that uh, can sit on the end user machine, monitor the wide system, and uh, detect ransomware and kill once it starts uh, encrypting the user's data. In, our, in, our, uh, in, in this talk, we are talking about the second approach, which is a detection tool that helps researcher and uh, reverse engineers to uh, get insight about internal behavior of this class of malware. So this is our threat model. In our threat model, we uh, assume that ransomware, like any other classes of malware, um, can use any techniques to attack the user. For example, they can inject code into the context of benign application in order to evade uh, some um, well-known uh, detection techniques, or perform enc encrypted communication with the CNC server to consult about the client and, for example, get the private key, uh, the public key. And three is uh, that we, we assume that it can use any customized or standard crypto system in order to attack the user file. We also assume that the OS kernel 
the uh, hardware and software stack in the kernel are uh, free from malicious code. This is actually a fair assumption because all of the ransomware samples that are in the wild are in the user mode and they don't attack the kernel driver in kernel. So in our approach and uh, the tool that we develop is try to detect ransomware and analyze them during the detection phase. It's not an end user protection approach. And uh, it can be used on top of dynamic analysis system as a public uh, service and uh, provide insight about uh, the ransomware. And it can be used for sample sharing about, uh, for uh, reverse engineers, for researchers, and uh, for the defenders. So, but the question is how we can detect a ransomware sample. Unlike other classes of malware that try to be as stealthy as possible, uh, in ransomware attacks, the, when you are infected with ransomware, you are informed that you are infected. Or there are some uh, distinct uh, behavior that ransomware has. Because encryption, for example, is involved in the attack, there is an entropy change in the content of the files, right? or because the, the malicious process wants to encrypt as many as files as possible in order to maximize the chance of uh, getting uh, money from the user, you see iteration over the files. Or you see a modal dialogue that shows that the user is infected. So if we use these high level heuristics and translate them into concrete defense approaches. It's possible to detect a significant number of ransomware in the wild. So the rest of this talk is actually the introduction of the tools and techniques we used and the evaluation of our approach to detect ransomware. So our, our approach is a, a system that uh, sits in the kernel and performs uh, system-wide process monitoring and the, the interaction of the process with the file system. And for requests like read and write, we, get the, we calculate the entropy of uh, the data block uh, when they want to, uh, for example, touch a file. We collect some other things that I'm going to talk about in the following slides. So in order to detect ransomware, we have to address two classes of ransomware. One is cryptographic ransomware that attack the user files, and the other is desktop locker that simply locks the desktop. So in order to uh, detect cryptographic ransomware, we generate a fake but attractive environment for the malware to run, and then sit in the kernel and uh, look at the interaction of the uh, process with the file system. So the question is, why we generate fake uh, user environment? The, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is we want to make the dynamic analysis system as relax, realistic as possible. And two, we want to protect the operating, the, the analysis environment from uh, certain user environment fingerprinting techniques that uh, a malware can use. For example, a static uh, environment analysis is very straightforward for the malware to uh, find out, for, regardless of the fact that the sample is running in a bare metal environment or in a VM, right? <clears throat> so in order to do that, we, uh, we want a strategy. So uh, in order to generate the content, we generate files with real uh, and valid content. The, the content uh, uh, look real, realistic. We distribute them randomly but meaningfully on the disk. And the metadata of the files are uh, designed to, to simulate uh, real user files. For example, the creation, the modification, and the access time uh, are designed in such a way that uh, the malware cannot easily detect whether it's automatically generated. So we generate the content and sit in the kernel. And 
run the malware and log uh, the interaction with the file system. So we collect the time, the process name, the process ID, uh, the request in form of IRP, the argument of the request, and the entropy of uh, the data buffer in case it's read or write. We analyzed a, a wide range of ransomware families uh, during our analysis, and we found that regardless of what uh, or how a ransomware attacked the, the user in, in order to compromise it or uh, being installed in the machine, the low-level file system activity are very similar. For example, crypto locker and crypto wall are two different ransomware families, but because they were using the same crypto API, they were generating very similar I.O. activity in the, in, in the low-level uh, file system requests. So based on that, we uh, categorize all the samples that we have based on their file system uh, access request, and we uh, find out th there are only three different classes based on the current ransomware attacks. And the first one, for example, opens the file and reads the low entropy data and overwrite it with the high entropy data. And in the second one, uh, what happens is that an encrypted version of the files is generated and is uh, saved in some part of the disk. And uh, the original file is simply unleaked uh, or deleted from the disk. But the attacker found out that it's easy for the victim to recover those data uh, that were unlinked from the disk. So uh, they changed their strategy. And uh, once they generated the encrypted version of the file, they overwrite the original one with the uh, random data, uh, a form of secure deletion on the original files. These are three ransomware families that uh, follow uh, those I.O. access requests. For example, CryptoWall, read the low entropy data and write, overwrite it with high entropy data. A file coder uh, simply del deletes the original data by unlinking from the disk. And the third one, CryptoWall, uses a different uh, crypto system and overwrites the original data with uh, some random uh, bytes, so having a, a sort of uh, secure deletion function. In addition to uh, those three different I.O. requests, because the attacker wants to ma maximize the chance of forcing the user to pay, uh, the malicious process encrypt as many files as possible. So you see iteration of the files. Regardless of what uh, extension a file has, you see exactly the same request among different files by the same process. That was actually our approach to uh, detect crypto uh, style or cryptographic ransomware. In order to detect uh, desktop locker ransomware, we what we did was that first we uh, take a snapshot of the clean state of the system and run the malware and then capture a, a, another snapshot uh, of the system. So if a ransomware attack has happened, there is a ransom node that's shown to the user. And because it is shown to user and it's persistent, there is an, a structural change between the the content of uh, pre and post attack images. So we define a score called the similarity score that uh, compares the structural differences between two images. So the, the, the similarity score is between 0 and 1. The values close to 1 means that there is a huge uh, structural change in the image. And the values close to 0 means there is 
no, not significant changes in the content of the image. In order to test the system and uh, run the, our tool to test with real world uh, samples, we use Kaku Sandbox. The reason is that uh, in order to provide, it actually provides us with basic uh, sandboxing services. And uh, we use Windows XP for that because it is mainly supported by Kaku, but uh, Unveil can be installed on any uh, operating system, uh, any Windows operating system uh, by just attaching to the file system driver. Um, we use the Windows kernel dri driver framework, which is formally supported uh, way to develop uh, monitoring services like antivirus companies and uh, antivirus uh, scanners and also backup uh, software use some more or less the same approach. And uh, for those that are in uh, malware research, they know that uh, running an, and finding an active malware is very hard, is not easy. So in order to make the system uh, resilient against these uh, fingerprinting uh, techniques, we actually, what we did was uh, making Kaku more resilient about this uh, fingerprinting by changing certain codes to, in uh, Kaku Sandbox in order to return fake response to cert certain fingerprinting techniques like for certain processes or uh, registry keys. Of course, there are more sophisticated ways to fingerprint the environment. We were not able to do anything about them, but these are the more straightforward approach that we were able to um, <coughs> address. We also uh, use other uh, anti-evasion measures like uh, defining uh, multiple NTFS drives or changing the IP address or MAC address. These are the things that we did. Uh, you can check out the paper for more details about uh, our configuration. We tested the system with our label and data, ground truth data, with 3,500 malware samples we collected from uh, public repositories, Anubis, and to security companies. Uh, from those 35,000 samples, uh, 1,900 of them were active during the analysis. And we also use uh, some benign application, including the ransomware-like uh, uh, pro, uh, programs, for example, uh, this script, AES script, S delete, in order to make our data set uh, having a both uh, benign and malicious data set. This is actually one of the false negative cases that we had. You see an, a structural change in the image, but because it's not the dissimilarity score is not significant because it's transparent. Uh, we were not able to detect that. So in order to detect these cases and have a higher uh, coverage of the data, we perform a uh, test by varying the, the similarity threshold. And uh, we found that at uh, point 32, we have uh, the highest uh, recall with 100% precision on the label data set which means that if we detect a sample as ransomware, it was 100% uh, ra ransomware. <clears throat> we also test our approach with unknown data set, unknown samples. We collected 1,200 uh, sample, unknown samples every day from Anubis. We uh, created an infrastructure with 56 uh, Unveil en enabled machines on eight servers on G Ganati cluster with the uh, same th threshold that uh, I talked about in previous slide. We tested the system with 148,000 uh, uh, distinct samples. And in our uh, approach, a new detection is if we detect a sample as ransomware, 
and uh, we uh, submitted to VirusTotal, and if VirusTotal reported reported it as a malware or a ransomware, uh, it's, it was not a new detection. But if none of the AV scanners uh, detect, report anything malicious about that, we detect it as, label it as a new detection. We continue to submit uh, the samples we detected as ran ransomware six, six times to virus total in order to see whether the detection rate changes. We define a score called a pollution uh, ratio, which is between 0 and 1. And the values close to 1 means that all the AV scanners in VirusTotal were able to detect a sample. And the values close to 0 means that none of the samples were detected by AV scanners. So as you see in the first submission, 72% of the samples had the uh, pollution ratio 0 means that none of them were detected by AV scanners in the first submission. But in the second submission, the pollution ratio changed uh, significantly. And uh, as you see in the subsequent submission, there is no significant change on uh, the pollution ratio, meaning that a sample is detected either by a large number of AV scanners or only by, by a small number of them. This is a summary of our detection result. Uh, we, got, we had false, uh, zero false positive cases uh, at the cost of uh, not detecting all the ransomware in our data set. And uh, as I mentioned, 72% of the samples were new detection. And we detected 9.2% uh, of uh, 9.2% of the sample that we detected were ransomware, including uh, crypto, um, cryptographic ransomware and desktop blocker. Around 20% of those were desktop blocker. During our analysis, we also found a new uh, ransomware family. Uh, we call it Silent Crypt. The reason we call it Silent Crypt was that uh, after a successful attack, uh, it the, the process showed a uh, ransom note and uh, claimed that they are Silent Crypt team. So we used the same name for that. Uh, what happens was that uh, it performed some uh, sort of uh, user fingerprinting in order to see whether they are running in a bare user environment or in an uh, analysis or in a real user uh, computer. And, uh, after consulting with the server and receiving the key, they started uh, encrypting the, the user's file. And as you see in the third row, uh, which is the write operation, it performed uh, some techniques in order to evade uh, potential behavioral-based approaches, like uh, imposing delays, artificial delays between uh, their operation. After a couple of rides, they uh, imposed some delay and then started again. We submitted uh, the sample to uh, AV to VirusTotal, and after two days, they started reporting it as malicious. This is uh, also the, the Google result in that time. We, uh, the first one is uh, the, the, the submission I had to uh, YouTube about the demo of the attack, the other are uh, unrelevant uh, Google results. So the conclusion of this work is that a ransomware is a, th a serious threat, and uh, Unveil introduces concrete models, concrete detection techniques to uh, analyze these class of malware. Detecting a new ransomware family uh, shows that this approach uh, is useful in practice and can be used without implementation costs on top of uh, anti-malware uh, anti -mal tools and dynamic analysis system. Uh, of course, our approach is not perfect, but uh, we continue to improve the work. Uh, and, uh, this, this field of research is an adversarial research, so we try to improve it and make it a public uh, service for uh, 
to be used by uh, researchers and uh, defenders and uh, reverse engineers. Thank you so much. I would be happy to have uh, your question answered. Questions? Hi, um, I'm Ryan from Google. Um, so I had a question about your uh, false positive rate. You said that you had like 9,000 new detections, but 0% false positives. How did you uh, compute that? How did I calculate that? Yeah. OK, uh, so for the desktop blocker samples that were around uh, 300 samples, 3,000 samples, we did it manually by just checking uh, the post attack images. If we see that the post attack image is a ransom note, we uh, call it, we report it as a the correct uh, detection. And uh, for uh, crypto style ransomware, we, what we did was uh, checking, uh, sorting the files automatically and finding whether uh, there is an iteration of where the files, for example, the, five, the first five files and uh, see the, if the, the content of the files has an entropy change. So uh, in our detection, uh, we use entropy to double check our result. We didn't use entropy in order to, uh, as a function, as a feature to uh, report whether a sample is ransomware or not. We use it to double check whether uh, the sample that we detected as ransomware is in fact ransomware or not. Like, could, couldn't you also use that entropy just to de de like detect it as well? Pardon? Couldn't you use the entropy to, to detect it as well? Uh, as, a, as a detection feature? Yeah. So, it, uh, a very good question. Uh, the problem with this uh, is that there are, you can, there are uh, certain cases that they have already high entropy. For example, uh, the file is a compressed file has already has n not very high, but it's, it has high entropy. So the change between the read and write, the entropy of the read and write is not meaningful in order to uh, report that as a change in a, the entropy of the file in order to report that as a ransomware. So we tried not to use that in our detection, but use it as a feature to evaluate our result. Okay, thank you. And very nice work. And um, just a quick question. Um, these ransomware samples, when you run them on your environment, um, they al almost always immediately start attacking. Um, what if they actually wait? Um, how long do you need to run them? I mean, um, yeah. How do you trigger them? OK. So uh, like uh, other um, dynamic analysis system, our approach is also vulnerable to stalling code. Uh, we run uh, the samples for 20 minutes and uh, with the assumption that uh, the attack will start after 5-10 minutes. But if it wants to wait for 2 days, 1 day, 5 hours, so we were not able to take anything. But if uh, the sample start in 10 minutes, after 10 minutes of running the sample and show uh, malicious activity, we were able to detect that. So typically in your experience, um, how soon does the attack start? Five minutes, one minute, ten minutes? So uh, we actually experiment that uh, in our first uh, phase of this project. And we found that after the seven to ten minutes, they start doing activity. This, this, this is actually what happened in our case. Okay, thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, so this is just another uh, question about the entropy um, check. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but how many samples did you look at um, to kind of get a good feel for what the threshold should be, or uh, is it a comparison for just a straight increase? Well, uh, good question. Uh, for for the entropy change, uh, we we checked. Uh, a couple of uh, samples, like uh, two, 250 samples. And uh, we found that 
B because the samples that the, the sweet file or the honey files that we were using were mainly text. And uh, we, found, we, we saw that, for example, an entropy change from 4, from 4.30 uh, to uh, that it's changed to, uh, for example, uh, above 7 means that a high entropy change. But as I mentioned, we didn't use that in our detection because it, 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 it was uh, something that can be evaded by the malware in future. So we didn't use that in detection. But for example, for the text file, uh, we were able to uh, confirm uh, that, for example, there is a huge change in the entropy. This is what we can say. Thank you. Uh, all right, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks.